Hi, this is Rob Wolf, Director of Communications at the Center for Court Innovation. Today I'm at the Open Society Institute with Herb Sturz. It's, it's, it's difficult for me to even begin to describe who he is because he's done so much. What draws me to him today in particular is a new book out by Sam Roberts called A Kind of Genius, Herb Sturz and Society's Toughest Problems, published by Public Affairs. Your career has spanned so much over the last four decades or five decades. The Vera Institute for Justice, for instance, you spearheaded its creation and led it, and Project Renewal, the Center for Court Innovation. Uh, maybe I should start out just by thanking you for having launched the Midtown Community Court, which led to the creation of the Center for Court Innovation, which has been my home for the last 10 years. I'm delighted. I thought I might begin with a big picture question, which is, in your incredible experience with public policy and government, what are the biggest changes that you've seen in terms of people's attitudes about what government can do and just the most important changes in public policy that you have seen? That's a large question, Rob. I don't think I've seen a great change over the 50 years as it relates to what can what government can do. I think we, um, um, back then, people felt that government could do almost anything. One felt, really, that it took the government to do things, and the role of the private sector was less out front than it is today. And um, I think there's been a much greater awareness, both on the private, nonprofit side or business side and government, that uh, you can do a lot more when you marry private, nonprofit, and government together. They're not necessarily on the opposite sides of the uh, line. In, in fact, they add to each other. The Center of Court Innovation is a kind of perfect example where you, uh, it started with one experiment working closely with the court, police, DA. It wasn't always easy, but um, it took both sides and, uh, and a lot of finesse and thought and understanding on both sides. So, To that extent, I think it's just open people's eyes more rather than saying it's a new role for government. If you want to call it a new role, um, as government has, has helped welcome the private sector. And, um, and that's something that um, Vera helped certainly start early in the, in the 60s. I doubt it, that it was original. It never happened before. But we made, made that very central to the way our modus operandi uh, in those years, and I think to this day. You, you have had an extraordinary talent, it seems to me, to connect with the right people, to bridge differences between people. I wonder what your secret is. There is no secret. What I, I have done and, and do to this day is I'm persistent. If I care about a problem, I stay with it, and I try to understand it. I try to understand it from everyone's point of view. And... Um, you're arresting somebody or stopping and frisking someone out on the street. What is the impact uh, on the person who stopped? What's the impact on that person's family? From the police point of view, does this really uh, cut down a serious crime, as they would suggest, uh, by um, making it more certain that people would leave loaded weapons or hard drugs home, if not? But those are the so you try to understand what is at play and what are, what are the collateral effects, what's more central. And so it's really a way of looking at, at a problem and not assuming you have a lock on knowledge and, uh, and also trying to understand, I guess, the motivation of individuals and um, uh, certainly in government, what do they need versus uh, the private sector, nonprofit sector. And, going at trying to uncover what's involved in a problem. So much of public policy, criminal justice especially, is fraught with ideologies, and things are interpreted through you know, left and right or conservative. Yeah. How do you get people to see beyond that into the, to, the sort of the practical aspects? Um, not difficult. On paper, they see it with the ideological fight. But my experience with police has been say with Skid Row derelicts, they didn't like uh, being thought of as uh, street cleaners, picking up the same drunk uh, down on the Bowery every day, nothing of value happening. 
administrators there uh, are aware that doesn't do the court system any uh, favor or anyone else, including the Skid Row derelict, to have them hauled into the lower courts every day. It could be done two, three times a day, and nothing of value coming. I think um, defense lawyers or prosecutors realize they've lost dignity dealing with an issue as important as this. If back then, you know, there were, I think, a third of all arrests were of this Skid Row type mm. in the city of New York. You're talking about the 1960s yeah. when, you, when you developed and, Project Renewal. And it was then called Manhattan Bowery Project, mm-hmm. and it evolved to Project Renewal. And uh, um, the police became our allies. The correction department understood it, said it said became our allies. It's not on all these things that everybody's going to become your ally. You have to go at a problem also at times when you're going to have uh, groups that are not sympathetic for, in their perspective for good reasons. You have to be very careful how you articulate something for sure, but you can articulate it in terms of, and we did, certainly both fairness and efficiency, mm-hmm. and they're not contradictory mm-hmm. to, and to achieve that. I think had Vera and its offspring from the beginning just put it as um, all we care about is uh, the, the maltreatment of defendants. We'd, we would have done some good things, but we'd never have taken it the next step to understand and open up doors uh, that weren't all that hard to break down. Uh, a good idea takes you away. So then you have to be, if I will say, a little smart and persistent and again, surrounding a problem and how to articulate it. So it sounds like seeing from the perspective of all the players allows you to find common ground. And when you know what the police, how they're seeing this problem, you can find a way to to come up with a solution that... Often. Not always. Right, okay. Not always. Uh And there'll be problems in anything. Or you may have to put it off a month or two months or three. Or you have to figure out what the entry point is to get support mm-hmm. and it's uh, and it differs there's no rule you have to get the feel of a situation the feel of what public policy person has to what his or her needs are at a certain time what politics of a government is well so let me ask you have you ever been arrested have you ever been through the justice system well let's see when I was about nine I was sort of arrested oh. uh, someone stole a bicycle that was in our garage. I had just my first bike. And they left an old used bike in there. And, and so I, that was all there was. And so one day, I, a few days later, I was driving the bicycle on the street and I felt someone grab my arm and said, that's my son's bicycle. Wow. And they took me, believe it or not, to a police station. And they put me behind a bar. I was, I bet nine. They couldn't have been Wow. And I, they called my family, and I was, you know, it wasn't it wasn't a real traumatic, but it was, I was sort of scared. I always remember mostly of everything the police bringing me in there, and um, and that arm, the hand grabbing me, and said, uh, uh, "You stole my son's bike." It's it's an it, it, it's an interesting story because it is. It's a comp- it's complicated story, you know. It's not like you were entirely you were innocent in a sense, but a on the sense. other hand, you understand that it, it was and, probably a stolen and bike. When it was, I, I yeah, did understand yeah. it, but also you got back to I was nine. Right. How yes. much did I understand? Well, right. And right. And, and I had support from my family right. that didn't know any, maybe, you know, the nuance of that. And then I was arrested, uh, as it were, at the University of Wisconsin, when a friend of mine who later became Deputy Police Commissioner of New York, and I were trying to earn some money and we, with our, a variation of a simonizing car wash business. And we put on, went up and down the street, putting on a, um, a little tag on people's windshields saying, here's your ticket to, to getting a good Simonized the police right. grabbed us and brought us into the police station in Madison, Wisconsin. And then the third sort of thing was in the universe uh, in Chicago, where I wanted to. F- um, I went for a weekend just to feel what it was like to be knowing it was phony in a way, but what it was like to be kind of poor. I went with old clothes and no money, really? in Madison, and and I spent a weekend um, sleeping one night in a flop house and another in a police that. The station, uh, 
and s spending it during the day in a um, sawdust covered you know, saloon, getting the feel of what it was like to just drink beer and all that sort of thing. So. Well, let me ask you, I know I'm sure you've told the story many times, but since I am from the Center for Court Innovation, maybe you could take a few minutes and just talk about what led to the creation of the Midtown Community Court, you know, what, what, what you were thinking at the time. Well, I've always was sensitive to the idea of community justice and working in the community. And that was consistent with uh, certainly early work with the Bowery, with Wildcat. I was also um, played a re role in the redevelopment of Times Square when I was uh, chairman of the planning commission. And uh, then I got to know Jerry Schoenfeld. I met him first in, in City Hall when he came to see Mayor Koch and I was deputy mayor. And Schoenfeld is the theater owner, and Broadway the theater producer. Of the whole Schubert organization. Right. And it was really over, I think, breakfast area. We always complained about panhandlers and, and the mess up on, in Times Square and what can be done about it. No one cared about the theater. Whether he first said it or I first said it, I'm not sure, but let, let's say he did about doing something with the courts, which is not necessarily original, the concept, in Times Square. And I do remember very well saying to Jerry, Jerry, you know, let's, if you give me a theater, I'll give you a court. Because I knew it would be so dramatic and that we, we could do it, and that would take care of a place in Times Square. He, I, he offered it rent-free for three years. And um, This is when you were a planning commissioner. No, this is while I was doing... Uh, housing, working for Mellon Corporation. So you weren't I just interested. in government, no, and you I mean, weren't no, in is, the judiciary, but you were promising you would give him a court. <laughs> yes. And um, one of the first persons I went to was, Jer uh, was Bob Keating. And Bob, uh, whom I knew, I mean, who in fact uh, followed me as coordinator of criminal justice when I was deputy. I see, um, and Judge Keating was, was the... Was the administ city administrative judge, criminal court. Right, of the courts. And... and Bob was welcoming of the idea, but we got overwhelmed by opposition uh, from neighboring real estate owners, from uh, theater preservationists. We had opposition from the New York County District Attorney. We had a mixed response from uh, the police at different levels. The defense bar was concerned about it. Will this be a plea factory? And so on. And. Um, and ultimately, we had to change the venue from the Long Acre Theater to the current home on 54th Street. There, I started with no money. I think I raised five or 10000 not more than that, I know, from uh, the Schubert Theaters. And then I, you know, I needed more money, so I went to see uh, Peter Goldmark, who was then president of Rockefeller. Very shortly, or practically at the same time, I hired John Feinblatt. And because then I had the nucleus of some money. Right. Not a lot. Right. But it started with like nothing. And you had to get the courts backing too. Well, not just one. You had to get, we had uh, to get the state administrative judge. We had to get ultimately the chief judge of the Judith Kay. And, you know, in the book we talk about the story of her coming the night before. Right. Uh, in her jeans to help whitewash the, 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 the walls of the court. Midtown Community Court and Red Hook. Uh, and then the center, we're blessed by two really extraordinary persons to really make it work, which is John Feinblatt and Greg Berman, two great people. And so maybe you can tell me a little bit about the kinds of work you're doing now. How are you occupying yourself here at the Open Society Institute? I guess I'm spending most of my time working on the mortgage foreclosure problems. George Soros asked me to try to real look at this and what the collateral impact on young people is when they get thrown out of school, have to move or lose their homes. And I helped set up something called the Center for New York City Neighborhoods, which became a not-for-profit that was set up by Sean Donovan, the now Secretary of HUD, and the mayor, and Christine Quinn, head of the city council. But I also went back to my past in helping to start something called the Neighborhood Improvement Project, taking the elements of supported work, where you put people, in this case, uh, welfare recipients and homeless people, and uh, capture their welfare entitlements through the city's Human Resources Administration, and put them out in work crews. Um, and ironically, the first 
group that received a, an award to do that from HRA was Wildcat Corporation. Mm. And so what I did was take the started. concept and bring it up 30 years later to a whole other big problem, which is mortgage foreclosure. And the idea is, can you use people like this, a sort of mini WPA, you might say, in the neighborhood, not to go necessarily with the houses that are foreclosed, but at the surrounding houses. And do what? Remove the graffiti, move debris, ranging from old refrigerators to cars, uh, resod the lawns, fix broken fences. You know, with Obama in the White House, uh, I just wonder what your hopes are for this administration, what you see that might be different. My thoughts are just filled with hope. I love to turn on the television and read the paper and see Obama in action, talking. I love to see Michelle Obama and the two kids. It gives me a great expanse of feeling that you have high, real quality people in the White House trying to do hard stuff. I have no wild expectations. This, uh, there's a lot of stuff that will be out of his control. But I feel there's a real intelligence and a, and a good heart going forward. Well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking to you. I've learned a lot. I've been talking to Herb Sturz, who is the subject of a new book, A Kind of Genius, Herb Sturz and Society's Toughest Problems by Sam Roberts, who details all of Herb Sturz's amazing achievements, whether he'll call them that or not, from the founding of the Vera Institute of Justice to the Wildcat Corporation to Project Renewal to, to the Center for Court Innovation, the Midtown Community Court. The list is quite long, and it's, and it's still being added to. So I uh, thank you for taking the time. This is Rob Wolf, Director of Communications at the Center for Court Innovation. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.